We are looking ahead to the second half of 2024. It's Monday, July 8th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. As we leave the first half of 2024 behind, we are looking ahead to what might be coming for the rest of the year. To your discussion about what's already happened this year, gave last Wednesday's episode a listen. Now we're looking ahead to what could be coming with our breaking news reporters, Margaret Fleming and Alex Schiffer, newsletter co-authors David Rumsey and Eric Fisher, and senior reporter Mike McCarthy. That conversation is next. Let's turn to the future, H2, which we are currently in. Uh, just What stories are you guys following? And if you want to throw out predictions, we'll take them. But uh, what do you think is going to be dominate from what we can see right now, obviously? What what are you looking at for you know the balance of this year? Um, and we can go in reverse order. Uh, Alex, what what's what's top of mind for you? Yeah, I, I guess you just start off the Olympics. I'll be curious to kind of see what comes of that. Obviously, there's been some concerns with some things of it, and and you know historically the Olympics have kind of struggled to make money lately. So how does Paris kind of deal with that? I know they've been tighter with the numbers on that front, but you know they're on the books for a reason. Doesn't always happen and translate to the actual thing. Uh, so I'd say that I'd say with the NBA draft just removed the, the LeBron brawny era in LA. I'm really curious, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of uh, former players, kids come through the ranks over the years, but never together. And uh, I, I know David's the, uh, the golf guy on here, but you know, brawny and, and Charlie Woods are kind of in similar buckets to me of like sons of legends who have shown promise a little bit, but haven't really like, I don't think Charlie Woods has made – I think he just qualified for out five for a PGA Tour event, David, I want to say. But, like, again, he hasn't – he's shown he's really good for his age but hasn't, like, made that next step. So I'm I'm kind of curious to see um, as some of these guys have their kids come in the spotlight more, how does the Bronny lebron thing go? And uh, what do we see from Charlie Woods as the, as the players' kids are, like, the new big thing? And uh, the only other thing I would just say is, is the coming college season of realignment. What does it look like with the Rutgers-UCLA – Big Ten game, and I don't think the Pac-12 is coming back, RIP, but just like what arises from these cross-country college football games and the stress on the student-athlete, and what does that maybe do to the transfer portal, and do people get into the portal just because of the geography of some of this stuff, and and burnout and whatnot. So those are kind of my – I Margaret start the, started with two on the first go-round. I'm now starting with three um, to kick it forward, yeah. Margaret, kick it over to you if Alex didn't just steal your whole list. No, not my whole list. I was going to bring up conference realignment also. I'm really thinking about these like smaller sports, these not smaller, but just like not football. These like um, sports that play midweek games, um, you know, that, you know, what is like a you know soccer player going to do with like a Wednesday night game, you know, 3,000 miles away or whatnot, and then having to come back. I think it's going to take a real toll on the student athletes. And um, I think it's it's going to be really apparent really quickly. Um, so that is definitely a storyline to look out for, both for football, but also for everybody else. Um, the other two, um, I mean, we should see any day now NBA media rights happening and just the fallout from that. What is that going to look like? Um, you know, where do we've already seen TNT starting to explore other places where they can get rights just about anywhere they can. Um, so what is that going to do to kind of the current rights landscape? Um, and then um the the other one I just threw out there, um, I think that tennis has been having a really big uh, go as of late. Um, I know they had a great U.S. Open last year, but um, with Wimbledon going on right now and everything, I feel like um, they've just been really having a, a big moment. Um, and they're at this critical point. I can't remember if Eric or David wrote about it this morning, but I was reading it this morning about um, how tennis is having you know, some of its older stars starting to really kind of move along and, and step out of tournaments. and um have to get big you know surgeries or whatnot and we're kind of seeing um you know this is really when the younger stars are, are coming into their own um on both the men's and the women's side um and so i think uh that'll just be interesting to continue to watch um as the sport is growing and then also as these you know younger stars are coming in just real quick on that athlete travel conference realignment thing i happen to you just get in a conversation with this is a little while ago with someone who was at it was a football player at at Cal in Berkeley last year and it transferred I think to Penn 
because he just didn't want to travel that much. And he said like half the team is like putting themselves in the transfer portal because yeah, like they want to play for our top school, but also they, they want to like have a life and not be on a plane all the time. Well, I was going to say, I think we saw that with some, some players going to the pros, choosing to go to the pros instead of traveling across the country, some coaches choosing to retire instead of going across the yeah. country, whether they came out and said it or not, it's just, it's a factor to consider. And I think a lot of people already have been uh, leaving so, for that reason. All right, Eric, go ahead. What is H2? What are you, what are you looking at? Very fascinated to see what's ultimately going to become with Diamond Sports Group and the local media rights of three leagues, MLB, NBA, NHL, are all sort of hanging in the balance in significant degrees. We've got a big hearing coming up at the end of July to try to confirm uh, a, co- a reorganization plan uh, for the regional sports network operator. We don't know whether or not that's going to get over the finish line. And even if they do, can they be a viable comp? Uh, company in the age of this accelerating media disruption. You've got leagues increasingly interested of taking back their local rights and considering other models and doing other things with them. Uh, Baseball has been very open about talking about that. You've had the other leagues uh, muse about that to varying degrees as well. By the time we get to the end of the year, I think we could be in a very, very different place with not only the state of the company, uh, but also the state of local media rights for these three leagues, which are significant sources of revenue. So, um, yes, there's a lot of focus on the NBA national rights and deservedly so, but this local piece is just as much of an issue. Yeah. And we could be heading toward a situation. It seems like maybe the most likely outcome here is something that no one wants except diamond, which is that they, they come out of bankruptcy. They're a viable company that gets to, um, keep hold of their current rights deals. And the leagues are just stuck with it for another, I, I'm not, yeah, I don't know the, the contract lengths offhand, but like, you know. It another, varies for each of the leagues, but we're talking of roughly three to seven years. Yeah, which is like kind of a long time to be like stuck in a media situation that you don't love when that's your bread and butter. And, it, and it's a weird situation, too, because Amazon is coming in as a post-bankruptcy financing and distribution partner. And these leagues would all love to be more in business with Amazon. In some cases are already in business with, with Amazon, but would really like to do it on their own terms. And, um, that's sort of the rub here that there there could be some interesting outcomes in using Amazon to help attract the next generation of fans and those n- never even considering uh, getting a cable package, much less canceling it. Um, but again, it's not going to be at least at this outset on the league's terms. And so it's it's a whole lot of uh, complications and complexity. And again, I think we could be in a pretty different place six months from now. In terms of revenue, like this will probably kind of, you know, I think there's actually a tighter range of where this all ends up for the next like year or two in terms of what the leagues are bringing in from, from local media. I don't see that as the big variable. I think the bigger variable is just like, yeah, how many people are watching? How many young fans are getting attached to a team that they then stick with for, for years to come? Um, be, or like, is their team just on cable where they can't watch it? Um, and that is where other fans can watch it. So, I mean, with your, the leagues, you just want every option available to them, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's something that I think we're going to be seeing ripple effects, however it shakes out, you know, years down the road. Yeah. I felt for a long time that the great existential question of the industry is developing the next generations, plural of fans, because there are so many more opportunities and options out there than when I was a kid or when my parents were kids. Um, and sports as powerful as it is, doesn't have that kind of singular hold on the culture as big. And I'll stand by my prior NFL comments as big and powerful as they are. They have a lot more competition now than they did a generation or two ago. And where those ne- next generations of fans come and how they're developed, it's a huge challenge for anybody in the business. David, let's, let's hop back to you. Uh, what are you looking at for you know the, the rest of this year? Well, first of all, I have to say I'm shocked that Margaret isn't watching what kind of new heights Taylor Swift is going to take the NFL to this fall. Um, I, I think that is, uh, you know, why, why not, right? Round two. I am. I am. Don't worry. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, let, let's turn to, to golf. Uh, Alex, I do like your, um, you know, Charlie Woods uh, shout out there. Yeah, he's, um, you know, he will get plenty of opportunities that he probably shouldn't, but uh, we'll, we'll see. He's still young. Maybe uh, 
he'll be a little bit more talented than uh, Bronny is at basketball. Um, in, in professional golf, though, I think we do need to be watching Live Golf first the PGA Tour and the forthcoming potential deal with the public investment fund of Saudi Arabia. You know, it was over a year ago that they first announced that framework agreement on June 6, 2023, and the one-year anniversary just passed, and there's still no definitive agreement. Um, but I will make a prediction for you, Owen. I think that in the second half of 2024, the PGA Tour and PIF will announce some sort of new deal, not just an extension of talks. I think they will announce a deal. I don't, I'm not going to predict that everyone's going to be happy with it or that it's actually going to lead to Live and PGA Tour coming together next year or in 2026. But I do think that there will be some sort of announcement, some sort of press release, some sort of plan to unify men's professional golf in the latter half of 2024. What it means and what will happen, I, I can't give you that. Yeah, that'll be so interesting to watch just because it, I feel like when these talks started, like live or like the, the Saudi Arabia felt like they were in a really strong position. Um, you know, their just ability to like buy up all these, these big golfers um, and the PGA Tour seemed to be coming to the table just out of necessity more than uh, desire. And now, correct me if I'm wrong here, it feels like lives just kind of still there out of inertia and the PJ Tour is like maybe doing okay. They've got this new this new group of investors, the Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy leagues starting in January. Maybe they're in the stronger position now, but I I, I don't know. I think it's hard to give the uh, upper hand to anybody. Certainly, the PGA Tour is in a better spot than Live Golf if they were to just go at it long term together. But really, you know, in the golf world, everybody just says the major championships are the ones that are benefiting, and the PGA Tour and Live are both doing themselves a disservice by not having the best players together. And that's what their talks are supposed to accomplish. And like I said, I think they will try to work something out by the end of this year, whether it actually succeeds and makes everybody happy. Uh, I'm not too sure about that. And swooping in to, to give his thoughts on the media world, we have senior reporter, Mike McCarthy. Thanks for, for hopping in, Mike. Um, uh, so I just want to get, um, as we're sort of, uh, wrapping up here, your thoughts on what what the the rest of the year holds, and you know if you want to throw in a big story from the first half, uh, but uh, more like what are you looking for in terms of like w what's going to break in the, the the rest of the year when it comes to the world of sports media? The big story for me is of course whether the NBA. Uh, we all of us here at Front Office Sports have been covering this like a soap opera. Uh, will ESPN retain the NBA Finals? Will TNT lose the NBA after 40 years? Will Amazon come in? Will NBC make a round ball rock comeback? I mean, it, it's been the biggest story uh, of the year in terms of media rights, and I think it's finally going to come to a conclusion uh, sometime this summer. I mean, right now, uh, Turner is waiting for signed contracts to see if they can match them. If they don't match them, the only alternative will be to go to court and sue the NBA to keep their rights, which I'm not sure – any uh, network uh, wants to do. So so that's going to be my main focus over the next couple of weeks, Owen, as it has been for months. Uh, and then uh, part B is Stephen A. Smith, uh, the great free agent at ESPN. He's looking for north of $20 million a year. Will he get it? We'll see. Yeah, and on the Stephen A. point, my my I always come back to he's going to flirt with leaving, but it just – like ESPN's where he's known and loved. And as much as he says, you know, I can do anything, I can go anywhere. I feel like first take is, is like truly his sweet spot. It's, it's obviously built around him, but I don't know if he can just step into, you know, Jimmy Kimmel's shoes or, you know, run for office and just like be a whole new guy. I don't know. I'm wondering how serious you think the Stephen A with, you know, flirting with, with something else, how serious that is. It's really a great question, Owen. Um, is Stephen A uh, a creature of morning TV and a creature of ESPN, or is he such a force that he can go into late night TV on his own? He could run for politics or set up his own independent operation, which he already has with uh, Mr. SAS Productions. I, I think it's a little bit of both. I, I think Stephen A has risen to the point where he is now the face and voice of ESPN, and he can call his own shots. You know, they used to call it the Jordan rules in uh, Chicago. Well, in Bristol, they got the Stephen A rules. 
nobody else can talk politics. He's on with Sean Hannity. You know, nobody else can do this. He's out there doing whatever he wants. So I, I think he's really calling his shots as the true heir to Chris Berman and Bob Lay and Keith Oberman and Dan Patrick and all the people we grew up on for 30 years. McAfee is the like, the other like piece of the, I feel like he's kind of like, I don't know. He's like the Joker to Stephen A's Batman or something. It's not a great metaphor, but like he's, you know, he's like an even more wild card where like every few months he seems like he's like, you know, maybe isn't going to be part of things going forward, but they need each other. And I don't know. It's just like they, they've embraced chaos in, in a way that we're not used to seeing from ESPN. There is something to that. Uh, you know, there's a story that hasn't gotten a lot of traction, but Stephen A. and McAfee, from what I heard, had a real blow up. Uh, they went at each other uh, over the phone. And uh, it was something to do with Stephen A.'s documentary on uh, Embrace Debate. But, you know, McAfee is the true wild card. He's the bad boy. You know, he's the one who will call out a Norby Williamson. He's the one, you know what I mean, who won't follow the rules. He's the one who will brag about his, you know, relationship with his Goomba, you know, Jimmy Pitaro and, and all this kind of thing. So, uh, you know, I, I think there is a little bit of a, an ego clash between them at ESPN. You know, is ESPN big enough for the both of them? We shall see. So much to chew on. Thank you all so much for, for joining us. Alex Shifter, David Rumsey, Eric Fisher, Margaret Fleming, Mike McCarthy. Thank you for joining us on the show. My pleasure. Thanks, Owen. Thanks, Owen. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, do us the favor of a quick rating and review wherever you're listening. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.